I joined MVCC in the fall term of 1970. Because of that, I witnessed many changes in the college during my 31 years of teaching. I was part of the third cohort of hires. Most of us were fresh out of graduate school, although there were some exceptions, uh, such as Joanna Kervitis and Al Monroe, who had been teaching for a while prior to this. I received my diploma from Northwestern University only a few days before the semester began, so I was really fresh off the boat. Uh, actually, I was a bit different also in another way from the rest of the 1970 hires. I was replacing a speech instructor who was having a difficult pregnancy and had to resign. Another difference was that I was hired to teach a subject that was not part of my expertise. I had a BA in biology, chemistry, and was all but thesis for an MA in English literature, which I finally completed in 1971 but uh, before I entered the theater program at Northwestern. But my theater degree was issued from the School of Speech there. Uh, classes were about to begin. Uh, I was registered with NU's uh, placement service, and Tom Zamanzo, dean of the subdivision, was desperate for an instructor. <laughs> it probably could not happen today, but at that time, teachers of all sorts were in short supply, so I got the job. Hmm. Because many of us were young and recently out of grad school, we were up for partying on our off hours, both on and off campus. This included wine and cheese luncheons on the moraine, usually on Friday, but sometimes on other days as well. Not surprisingly, there was also romance, because dating around a lot, besides dating around a lot, there were several marriages uh, that, before the end of 1975. Uh, Mike and Jane Haynes, who met and married before I joined the faculty, Dick and Sharon Fritz, Margaret and Ray Lehner, and Bob Dugan and myself in 1975, to name but a few. The first president of Moraine, Robert Turner, had two major foci in his educational philosophy, interdisciplinary learning, no departments, and no unions. In 1970, the college was divided into two subdivisions. A and B. Really catchy names. <laughs> Each subdivision was supposed to be its own standalone entity. Both had the same general education courses, but each had its own specialty. B tended to have more technology and career or oriented courses like drafting and design and auto mechanics. A tended to be more transfer oriented. Later subdivision C was added. In addition, it was to be a college without walls, at least inside the buildings. Large rooms were divided into smaller classrooms as necessary by sliding room divider curtains and, in the new building, actual heavy drapes. Try having students give speeches while a film on emergency childbirth is playing on the other side of a rather thin drape. The faculty and staff were also housed in wallless offices. My first office in the 200 building consisted of a desk and chair that butted up against the desk of Mike Haynes, English Literature and Composition. Around us were similar arrangements of desks with a mix of disciplines. Joanna Kervitis, Chemistry, Tom Barrett, Economics, Barbara Lehrman, Margaret Milner, later Lehner, Judith Martin, Al Monroe, all English. And behind a wall of bookcase, a similar set of, setup of desks and chairs with math mathematics and environmental science faculty. This was in the south half of the 200 building. The north half was administrative, admissions and records, finance, etc. In the south half, we shared the space with, of all things, the dean of students, or the coordinator of educational support, library, audiovisual, etc., and the president of the college, Dr. Turner and himself, all without a wall in sight. The only interior walls in this temporary structure enclose the bathroom facilities and the boardroom. More about this wallless culture when I talk about the buildings themselves. An important element of the interdisciplinary focus was the team teaching of humanities, rhetoric, composition, and sociology. I think that's correct. I wasn't part of the, that aspect of instruction, and it had a particular name which I can't remember. 
Students signed up for three courses, nine hours credit as a unit. There were as many as 90 students in each unit, and there was an instructor for each of the areas involved in each unit. The theory was that students learn best in an environment of dissemination, i.e. lectures, discussion, and implementation uh, using that new knowledge. The team would prepare the dissemination sessions together using a particular theme for the semester or a part of semester, and all the students would be together in those sessions. Then the group was divided into three traditional size classes to explore the topic presented and how it related to the different disciplines with the faculty rotating among the groups so that everyone looked at the information from all three perspectives. Implementation was, of course, projects like research or papers on a topic. I may be off on this, this is how I remember it, but as I said, I was never part of one of those teams. The 600 building was uh, where most of these classes were taught. It, inc it uh, included two large lecture dissemination halls with a shared audio-visual room from which two films could be screened simultaneously. Uh, one end of those halls could be divided into three smaller classrooms by metal and plastic room dividers for the discussion sessions. The theory is sound. The implementation of it would become a logistical nightmare when we moved into the permanent A and B buildings. There were permanent dissemination rooms, lecture halls, but how to, dis to schedule those discussion sessions around other classes became very difficult. Also, as with any group effort, certain faculty tended to get the brunt of the work and the others just skated by. This structure was finally dropped after Dr. Turner's death in 1974. When I retired in 2001, the college's courses were organized in traditional department fashion by discipline. Dr. Turner's anti-union stance also collapsed. Promotion and pay were supposed to be based on merit, not on longevity. But many in the faculty saw the awarding of merit pay especially to be based on administrative women bias. During 1973-74, these feelings began to boil over, and a vote to unionize was held and passed by the faculty. After Dr. Turner's death in the summer of 74, the new president held a hard line on contract negotiations, and that fall the faculty staged its first, and only, by the time I retired, strike. Our headquarters was the old Catholic Church on the hill at 107th and Keene, and my husband Bob, who wasn't my husband at that point, and I uh, picketed uh, various places on the campus. I remember that very well. Anyway, uh, I forget how long the strike lasted, but it wasn't. It was no more than a couple of weeks. After the union was fully entrenched in a promotion and pay scale system similar to that of many of the local high schools and colleges, with lanes based on education and experience and a number of raised steps in each lane, uh, which a faculty member would ascend each year of service, was instituted. Uh, although the college became, began an innovate, as an innovatively structured institution, so the, sub, the, sub, yeah, the subsequent innovation was primarily in the types of course offerings rather than in the ways in which the material was presented. The major exception was in technology. When I began at Moraine, the highest technology the faculty had for teaching were slide and film projectors, overhead projectors, selectric typewriters and early forms of Xerox copiers. For much of our classroom material and handouts, we still relied on ditto and mimeograph machines. You remember mini mimeograph machines, right? <laughs> By the time I retired, every faculty member had at least one computer in their office, all of which were now walled with locking doors as much for security and equipment as anything else and the computers and other AV equipment were in every classroom. Indeed, some subjects like CAD were taught primarily through classroom computers. Buildings. When I came to Moraine in August 1970, there were 12 temporary shed-like buildings that held everything from administration to classrooms to the library. Food service were vending machines in the two mini lounges, one for each subdivision. 
The buildings were referred to as temporary because they were only supposed to be in use for about 10 years, but they weren't finally torn down until 1995. They were numbered for no reason I ever understood, from 200 to 1,500, skipping both 100 and 300. The 100 building was later built during my first year and went into use for the 1971-72 term as a mock-up for the way in which the permanent buildings would be used when the A, G, and L buildings, which were then under construction, were completed. Uh, there was also a uh, cafeteria in the 100 building. I never understood why there was no 300 building. They were The buildings were in two rows, odd and even numbers. The odd numbers began with 500 and ended with 1,500. And the even numbers went from 200 to 1,400. In the summer of 1971, the 1,400 building, or was it the 1,200 building, and there was no 400 building. 1400 building either. I'm not clear on that much either. Uh, at any rate, the, four, the, the that building burned down and was never replaced. Until all the buildings were torn down, it was referred to as the slab. Some of the buildings were mixed use, like the 200 and 400 buildings. Others were dedicated to one area. 900 was a library, 600 was team teaching, and all college meetings, etc. As the permanent buildings A, G, L, and later B came online, the temporary buildings became whatever else was needed. 500 became the music building, 600 became the theater. Many of the classroom areas were used for non-credit, community-oriented classes or storage. From the mid-80s until we moved into the FPAC, the 900 building was the theater office. Until computers made locking particular offices necessary, none of them had walls. Although the interplay between the faculty members with each other and with the administration was often beneficial, there were some real drawbacks. Things were stolen from decks and desks and bookcases. Faculty had no place for private conversation with students, and many of our students had difficult and or sensitive problems that they needed and wanted to discuss. To alleviate the privacy issues in the new buildings, faculty were given partitions between their desks, although the office areas were still open to the hallways. That continued to be a problem, especially as the college grew. By the time I retired in 2001, the temporary buildings were all down, although the 100 building was still standing at that time, and a number of permanent structures had been built, the A building, G, the gym, L Library were opened around uh, 72, 73. These were followed by B, C, the College Center, T, Technology, and F, the Fine and Performing Arts Center in 1994. And the hangar. I'm not sure what, what letter it's referred to by now, but it looked like a misplaced airport um, hangar as it was going up. It was under construction when I retired. My favorite building architecture story occurred when the, when the A, et cetera, were being built. The drawings were put on display one day for the faculty to look at and comment on before the interior was finished. As we were looking, someone, I think it was either Bob Dugan or Bob Van Race, I'm not sure, uh, noticed that the auto mechanics lab had been placed on the second floor. Difficult to get cars in and out. <laughs> When this was brought to the architect's attention, they suggested, very practically, among other things, to add a hydraulic lift outside the building to get the cars up there. Of course, that would be more expensive, and we're talking about the plains of Illinois, where it gets cold, icy, and snowy in the winter. What weather like that would do to hydraulic fluid could easily be imagined. Cooler heads prevailed in the auto area, was switched with the biology labs, which had been placed on the first floor. My own thought is that the architects thought that the biology labs were more visually, visually interesting on the main floor than an auto shop. Luckily, both the technology and fine arts facility, faculties were consulted when those buildings were designed. And although we didn't get everything we asked for, they seemed to be functioning well when I left. Theater. As I said, when I was hired, it was to teach public speaking. 
This was not my field, and after I earned my master's in English literature in 1971, I lobbied to be able to teach either humanities or literature. There were no theater courses, which was indeed my true field. The only reason for the English Lit MA was due to the fact that the university I was attending, the American University of Beirut, when I decided to change my field from biology to Eng uh, to something else, had no theater degree, and English Lit was the closest I could come. I wrote my thesis on drama. Then when I returned to the U.S., I applied to, uh, to the theater master's program at Northwestern. Although there were no theater courses, students were still interested in theater and putting on performances. A group wanted to form a drama club and asked me to be their sponsor. They got a minimal amount of amount from student activities uh, for productions and had to raise most of the money from ticket sales in, or other means. In spite of those drawbacks, they put on an original play and one of the student, by one of the students and also Neil Simon's The Star-Spangled Girl, which were quite good. When Joyce Porter, also with a theater degree from Northwestern, but hired to teach humanities, um, joined the faculty, the two of us worked with the students and our attempts became, became more ambitious. This was a time when plays made up of a series of related one acts were becoming popular. Plays like Plaza Suite and You Know I Can't Hear You When the Water's Running were good choices for the drama club as one student did not have to carry the weight of a full-length production. Uh, Joyce and I also directed some one acts ourselves, but we didn't want to do anything more ambitious if we weren't getting paid for it. By 1973, we were getting more ambitious, however, and Joyce decided to direct the musical Fantastics. I do believe that uh, student activities uh, popped with a little money to pay us at that point. Bob Dugan, who had a theater background from college, but who was teaching drafting and design, joined us as well, giving us some needed technical expertise. We were also getting some more money from student activities and had, de and had developed and were teaching uh, Introduction to Theater as a humanities course. Then Dr. Fred Gaskin became the college president and he was interested in raising the profile of the arts on campus. We petitioned him for enough money to put on a full production of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream in the spring of 1975. I directed, Bob designed, and Joyce handled the production or money aspects. We staged it outside by the area that had a raised bed of crabapple trees and hoped that our dates corresponded with their flowering. It did, and Titania and the fairies had flower petals raining on them as they ran through the trees. Because we couldn't depend on the weather and could not do night performances because we couldn't afford to do outside lighting, we decided to do two night performances indoors and also move the afternoon shows indoors if there was rain. The sets were very simple, just screens of flats and a couple of benches. We were always interested in recycling rather than destroying sets after productions, and those two benches were still in use in the theater, albeit held together by dozens of layers of paint from different shows they were used in when I retired. After the success of that show, we were able to get funding for a four-show season each year. We wanted to make the theater as financially viable and educationally useful as possible. Each season consisted of two non-musical productions, one a classic, one popular, Shakespeare and a musical in alternating years because both types were expensive to produce, and, uh, and a student-directed play usually one act, so several students could experience directed, directing each year. Uh, the student-directed play very often turned out to be some, something that was a little bit more avant-garde as well. Uh, we continued this for, format, successfully keeping on budget from the fall of 1975 uh, until 1994 when we moved into the new Fine and Performing Arts Building. We performed in the 600 building and all of the team teaching classes had moved into the A building, there were still classes being held there, including Introduction to Theater. 
When we were performing, we had to wait until classes were out of the building at noon on Friday to start putting up movable platforms for both performance and seating. So, the, so all our sets had to be able to be knocked down, stored, and put back up easily. We would use one weekend to dress rehearse, knock down the sets, then perform for two weekends, knocking down the sets and seating in between. After a few years, we were allowed to close the movable walls that divided the three smaller classrooms from the lecture hall so that we could leave a set up during the run. We still had to set up the seating each weekend. We performed Thursday, Friday, and Saturday evenings and Sunday matinees for two weekends. We, I believe the first time we were able to close off the the acting area was for Joyce's play, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. During a sabbatical in 1975, I formed the Touring Children's Theater, which performed short plays in local schools and libraries all over the college's district. The students got credit for creative drama class as well. The Touring Children's Theater continued until after we moved into the Fine and Performing Arts Center. Overall, Joyce, Bob, and I directed or acted as mentor for almost 100 plays on campus from 1975 through the move to the FPAC in January 1994. Bob directed his last play, Prelude to a Kiss, that spring as he retired the summer of 1994, and I directed Romeo and Juliet as the first play in the building. The Touring Children's Theater performed between 15 and 20 plays for about 20 plus performances each during that same period. The students were amazingly dedicated and still are, as shown by their attendance at our reunion in 2014 and their Facebook posts. Uh, my last pr production there was The Middle Ages, which I did in the spring of 2001. Was there an incident or an occurrence on campus that made you feel really proud that you were employed at the college? Most every time our students performed, I think. The, uh, you know, the, the quality of the work that they did was, I think, very, very good for the, you know, where they were in their learning experience and I was very proud to be a part of that. Uh, one of the things that I didn't mention that I think probably, uh, I'm sure other people have mentioned that too, when the college started, it was uh, not very diverse, to put it mildly. And uh, the diversity at the college has just, you know, uh, been, the development of diversity at the college, I think, has been excellent over the years. 